Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Um, when I came into this room, it was very full. And gradually, as the session has worn on, people have dropped away. So thank you very much for staying. Um, I'm, not, I'm not the only one between here and lunch. So um, it's, not, it's not down to me. Um, I'm Paul Twel Love Twelves, uh, consulting at uh, Consentus. Um, I was going to take the obligatory about us slide out of here, but um, one of the things I want to point is that uh, King Identity, who nicely teed up this session, are, are one of our partners. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I, I do appreciate your slide about the additional chal challenges for uh, open banking. Um, and that's particularly what, what we're talking about. So I think during this session, it's less about the technical um, bits and bytes of APIs. It's more about how you protect, at an application layer, uh, your business from, from bad actors. Even though they may be doing exactly everything they should do over your API, you need to understand that there are still bad people out there and you need to protect from them. So um, we're a reg tech company. Um, the main reason for being here is we deliver our service via an API. So our whole ethos is by um, making a simple plug and play solution to help people become compliant, uh, a very simple development method. So, so we really are bought into the, the API methodology. Um, what I was going to do is um, have a quick couple of quiz questions just to get everyone into, into, um, into the spirit of things. So uh, please, please be interactive. So this, this is a, a question. Does anyone know the significance of, of, of this number? Exactly. So, um, yes. So, PSD2, it's, it, when it needs to be, it, it is now live. Literally, it is now live. So, anyone who hasn't adopted this is non compliant. You know, and and we're, we are, we're not in the business of telling people they need to be, they should now be. And, and there's, in the UK, the FSA have given people a, a six month adjustment period. But literally, that is a, an adjustment period, not a delay to the, the timescale. The timescale is we are live. Um, if you saw the uh, opening plenary from Gavin um, this morning, he, he did a much, much better job of describing the issues around PSD2. So I'm not going to go anywhere near trying to replicate that. But uh, thank you for, your, thank you for, for spotting the issue. Um, does anyone know the significance of these numbers? Okay, so so if you if you monitor open banking statistics in the UK, you'll see that these are the uh, the number of API calls uh, and the growth rate over the last year. Um, so so this time last year, you know, there was a very small number of uptake, obviously because you know, the ecosystem wasn't properly live. But over the last couple of months, the numbers really are motoring. Uh, you know, we're seeing 135. This month, it's over 150 million calls every month and and that's with a very very low uptake of consumers with their banks so just imagine once psd2 starts to be used and and the adoption rates by customers grow the numbers really are going to be huge and this is just the uk it's not even going near europe um at the moment europe is about 12 months behind um, the uk uh, so we had a head start we started with open banking invitation psd2s on a diff slightly different track in Europe. They're a little bit behind, but a much, much bigger market. So I think when they become on stream, these numbers are going to be dwarfed. So I have one, one more set of numbers, and then, then, then I'll get on to talk about the interesting stuff. Um, any guesses? Does this mean anything to anybody? OK. Um, so th these are, in fact, the number of TPPs that are currently out there. Um, starting to look at banks for data. So Gavin talked about all of these people, um, you know, the people who are going to bank accounts. Um, in effect, we as consumers, we give these people our consent to go and ask the banks for our data on our behalf. So there's 90 currently in the UK, there's about 220 across Europe, um, but there's 300 just in the UK going through the process of uh, authorization. Um, in Europe, you know, the numbers are, I would say they're bigger, but they're, they're, even then they're still slightly delayed because they're this 12 teams behind. So, so the numbers are going to be huge. And um, there's a bit of a, a geographic uneven split. So, so the largest player in, in the market is in the UK, 
but we're seeing them pretty much everywhere. Um, this chart shows, interestingly, zero in Poland. Uh, and when my colleague presented this at a, um, a conference last week, he, he, was, he was informed, actually, no, there are, there are TPPs now in Poland. They're just starting to go through the process and being confirmed. So it's a complete moving picture. OK. So, oh, I see. The last question. Does PSD2 access accounts apply to me? So I'm not sure how many in the room, obviously, people are interested in PSD2 here, but how many people from banks or from people who would be an account provider in the room? One, two, okay. So, so do you think PSD2 applies to you? Okay. So, so this is one of the big questions that I'm um, asked when I, when I go and talk to people. There's a lot of people who aren't there yet, despite the fact that they should be, the, the deadline's passed, they're putting their head in the sand, they're saying, well, it probably doesn't apply to me. No, the, the legislation is very clear. If you operate a payment account that's currently online accessible, then you're within scope of PSD2, and you need to do all the things that Gavin was clearly explaining this morning about making the data openly accessible and complying with the regulations. So, what, what does this mean? And, and this is where we start to talk about APIs. So, thank you for your patience. Um, I think this is the first slide that's got API actually written on it. So, on your left-hand side is, in effect, the traditional way of accessing accounts. So, currently, your, your end customers, they go to your mobile application, the bank's mobile application, or their website. They log in. They use whatever access tokens. We've just been here, you know, whether it's password, credentials, increasingly biometric on the mobile phone. And they go straight into the bank. Everything's nice, easy, controlled, managed. All of that security is all in place. You know who your customer is, and it's a closed loop. Everything's fine. In the brave new world, uh, we have this new um, PSD2 open access. These 300 new players, these 220 TPPs across Europe, suddenly they now have the right to come and ask the bank for their customer's data. Um, and the provision of PSD2 has put this new interface in place. So whether that is um, an API, um, the legislation, as Gavin said this morning, doesn't mention API anywhere in it. It's strongly recommended that people adopt APIs, but there is also an option for using a, a modified customer interface, or in effect screen scraping, but, but with, um, with some enhanced security. But whichever uh, option you take, you, as a bank, cannot deny any authorized third party access into your platform, because that's mandated in the regulations. So. Um, what does, the, what does the bank, the financial institution, need to do? Well, firstly, obviously, they need to grant access. And, and we said whether that's a, an API or it's a modified customer interface or something. And there are, there are lots of standards around that. We've heard of UK Open Banking, Berlin Group, STET in France. Or, or you can make your own standard. So, so some of the big people like uh, Stripe, PayPal, you know, they've had APIs for a long time. So they can, in effect, reuse those. They need to put around it some authentication and some identification. So it's key under these regulations that the third parties coming in, you as the bank, you need to know who exactly who that is and ensure that that third party is a regulated entity. Um, I, I, hopefully everyone was in the talk from Gavin this morning, so I'm, I'm relying on that rather than repeating it. But the onus is um, you can only provide information to regulated third parties. If you give this information to someone who isn't a regulated third party, then you're breaching PSD2, you're breaching GDPR, all of your final, all your duties as a bank, take due diligence, take care of your data. You know, um, just because someone walks up with a key doesn't mean you let them in your house. You need to know they are actually who they're meant to be. Um, the third part in PSD2 talks about strong customer authentication. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that because we could be here all day. So, um, who who is aware of EIDAS certificates? Okay, perfect. That's that's about half. Who who 
after reading the last Q&A from the EBA, thinks that just checking an EI dust tip kit is entirely sufficient and all you need to do to validate a TPP. Perfect. Okay, that, that's, that's exactly the right answer. Because uh, what we've found is a lot of um, people read that judgment or heard about that judgment and said, okay, all I need to do is just check an EI dust certificate and I'm done. Um, there's no more work I need to do. And, and basically that's, that's not accurate because the EI dust certificate is issued at a point in time, a little bit like your, um, your passport or your MOT certificate. Um, the only way you can actually val just check that that is a valid permission is to actually um, check that that is still um, a regular committee. So, so your MOT certificate, you know, is the car still reliable? You know, your passport. Now, every time you come back into the UK, they put your passport through the reader and actually check that you're not, um, you know, on some watch list or or in, in some other piece. You know, they don't look at it and say thanks very much. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll not dwell on this, but this, this talks about those two options I talked about earlier. But uh, the key thing is, whichever option, whether you're using um, an API or this modified customer interface, um, you need to check that the TPP is identifying themselves properly with an EI dust certificate. Um, you need to ensure that um, they are still regulated by checking their regulated status. Um, and the third thing is, is then around issuing access tokens for ongoing consent. And that's, that's the sort of thing that uh, my colleagues from, from Ping talked about, is about that ongoing access. And, and once you've admitted someone, you need to know who they are. So the third part, I think everyone does that, and you do that already in the direct model. Um, the other two are, are new things about when you're talking to TPPs. So let me just try and summarize the issues. So in terms of working out um, so your consumer is instructing uh, a TPP through a mobile app or whatever um, they're coming into your bank to try and validate that this TPP is who they say they are there's a lot of issues um, you've got um, multiple multiple databases well sorry first of all the QTSP the EI dust certificate is issued by one of 70 QTSPs across Europe Currently, there's around 12 or 13 that are doing these financial EI dust certificates, but that, that number is going to grow as the market matures. So you've got a large number of entities issuing certificates. You've got 31 national regulatory authorities across Europe that you need to go and check with. There's also a central register, uh, or multiple central registers held by the EBA, which contain some additional information. Um, and then there's, there's multiple different schemas, like Berlin Group, um, which brings some different requirements. So there's a m whole range of different data sources. But on top of that, there's, there's the issue of, of how do you do that. Um, so I'm just trying to read it from here so I can make it sensible. Um, the, as, Ping, as, as Ping said, there is no direct relationship between the TPP and you. So you have to let anybody in. So you have no prior knowledge. So you do have to make sure um, you've checked this thoroughly. Um, but the liability sits with you as the bank. So if, if, if a TPP asks you to make a payment on your customer's behalf, um, you're the one who's putting the money onto fast payments and sending it off to someone else. You know, it's your liability. Um, Gavin talked about data at rest in the AISP model. And I think that's, that's a, a, a slightly different position. If you, once you've, but if you've given the data to somebody who isn't authorized, you're still liable for it, for a, a disclosure under GDPR, um, but in in a in a fraud case, you know, the money if people are going after the money through the uh, the PISP model, then then you are the one who's giving the money away. So you really, really do need to know who it is. But there are other issues. There are things like passporting. You know, um, these TPPs um, we've seen in Poland. There, there's a Lithuanian TPP that's been passported into Poland. So it's not a Polish entity, it's a Lithuanian entity that's passported in. And, and the same is happening in the UK. Um, we have a slightly more mature market there. So, um, you've got a duty of care with GDPR. But all of these things, it's about being uh, scalable. You know, we've seen the growth in volumes. Um, how do you build a scalable solution? And how do you build an operationally sustainable model? Um, 
it's fine at the moment as we see volumes. Although they're big, they're still early stages and people are thinking they can manage with um, you know, some, some desk checking or, or you know, a, an interim solution, a workaround solution. That, that's just not going to happen. You've seen the growth rate of these transactions. We are looking at how do you manage this going forward, staying compliant, but also coping with the increase in volumes. Um, and we've also seen, I, 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 I don't know all the details yet, but we've seen a couple of early fraudulent cases come through. Um, we're trying to get more information on that, but this is something that people are starting to attack. So um, I wouldn't lay all of this out without, without giving you an answer, obviously, because that's, that's one of the reasons we're here. Um, so in effect, what, what we do as consensus, we sit in that flow um, and we provide a whole bunch of, a bunch of services around um, checking the IDA certificates um, and validating the TPPs against their regulatory status. Um, we do that as a cloud-based solution and we make all of that information available via an API. So um, bang on the API subject again. Um, the idea is that we take the problem from you uh, and just re replace that with a data feed through our API. So I'm just rushing through this one because this, this next slide is, is, is my favorite slide which really describes what we do. So in terms of you as the customer, uh, you as the bank, when, when a third party provider comes in and requests uh, access to the data, you take their credentials. Um, we don't ask any more of you than that. You just literally take the credentials that they've used to establish the secure connection. So they, they get, they're mandated to use the IDAS certificate. So it's, it's a re very straightforward job of just taking that from your um, from your comms layer into your application layer. Pass that to us via an API. And then we go off, we do the checking against the QTSP, make sure the certificate's not revoked, it's not it's uh, properly formed. There's a full chain back to the root certificate, so everything's properly legitimate. Then we take the identity from that certificate and we go off and check against all of the relevant, uh, or against the specific national competent authority uh, who can tell you whether they're still authorized and their role. So are they still a PISP? Are they an AISP? Does that meet, does that match the request you're being asked for? Um, we give that information back to you. You then say, fine, thank you very much. Uh, I'll give my data to my customer. And we store all of that away in a, in a immutable log. So if there are any issues, then you've got a, a timestamp log that says, you know, that's 12.30. I checked this guy was an authorized person. If, if some point later on he's not unauthorized and your customers start complaining, well, you know, as the bank, I did everything within my power under the reg legislation I, that I could do. Um, we, we are seeing yeah, banks coming and going. The T, TPPs, a lot of the TPPs are fintechs. You know, uh, um, their license could be withdrawn quite easily. Um, in terms of the way we deliver this, as I said, we deliver it via uh, an API. Um, but the whole five minutes, thank you. The whole piece is built on Amazon Web Services. It's scalable um, and it's highly resilient. Okay. So hopefully, this might some of the people who stayed in the room for looking for something interesting. Um, does this start to appeal to, to some of you guys? Um, the whole ethos around the solution we developed at Consensus was to make it a, a plug and play API based solution. Um, we see that um, banks don't want to spend time thinking about um, regulation and compliance. You know, it's, there's money for them to spend on this, but it's a side issue. It's not core competency. What they can do is just call our API. We give them all the information they need to, to meet that compliance headache. Um, what we found, what we do to support that, we've got uh, documentation, we've got a swagger site on our portal. Um, the sandbox is fully available. Um, and from our current customers, literally they can test in a couple of hours and, and be live within a week. If, if, if they've got the internal pressure to do that, it's very easy to do that. Uh, not everyone has the same drivers, but um, the ones that are keen to get live very quickly, we can very much support that. 
So, is that okay? Okay. So, why why use consensus? And and I guess this is you know it, it, I'm summing up now. So um, we have a comprehensive solution. So there are other people who do similar things to us, but not in such a comprehensive way. Nobody's checking both the certificates and the the full regu regulatory status via an API. So so we, I think at the moment we're we're a unique solution for that. Um, we take away all the complexity. So all of that stuff you don't need to worry about. Um, and it's not a static picture. You know, um, We've got a team, um, the development team are in Reading, but we have people who are specifically looking at the regulate the, all of the different competent authorities every day, looking for updates, working through, as they, as they change their process, we're adjusting our process. So it is a bit of a maintenance nightmare. So we've done this stuff once uh, and taken away all the complexity from you. Um, it's a reliable platform, and it's a very performant platform. So, so it's designed. Our architects were basically have come out of Visa, so their guys are used to building high-performance engines. So, we don't have any issues about um, supporting uh, mission-critical platforms through our API. Um, I think a slide on 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 our our differences. The biggest thing, and I. This comes back to a, you know, this is a, a business slide rather than a technical slide. But the biggest thing for me is, um, it's about the risk transfer. So we take liability for the data we provide. Um, so your, if you've used our service, we give you the data, we warrant the data. If there are any issues, then then we've we've got indemnity cover to make sure everything's put right. Um, that helps. That means then you can rely on that data. I mean, you can use that in your risk mitigation. You can use that in your fraud prevention strategies. Um, and as I said, it's quick to implement, um, which gives you speed to market, which saves you the trouble of building a project team internally. You can use your guys to actually do the interesting stuff. You know, one of our customers had a team of 60 people doing all of their PST2. Rather than spend time worrying about compliance, they plugged our API in within a week, and now they're building their own services to go off and, and add some real value to their customers into their journey. So, thank you. So this, this is my, my last slide. So thank you very much for that. Um, so key takeaways. Um, the new channels are there. You know, PSD2, open banking are bring, is bringing new channels to market. These TPPs will be uh, approaching any financial institution that holds data. Um, from a compliance perspective, the banks need to open access. They must do. But on the other hand, they must only provide access to authorized people, because otherwise they're they're, they're, just, they're just throwing data at anybody. Um, and from our perspective, we make supporting that very easy through our plug and play solution. Um, and we do the two things that you need to do, not just one of them, but we do two other things uh, about validating the IDAS certificates and um, making sure that the regulate the TBP is a fully authorized entity at the other end of the line. That was my last slide. Um, we got time for questions or are we in a rush? Okay. Oh, oh there's, there's one. Okay, so uh, I'll just I'll just show you this I'll show you this slide, which is we we source the data from the 31 national competent authorities across the whole of Europe. Uh, in the UK, it's the FSA. Uh, every every country has their own specific central bank with this data, so we pull that in. We maintain that centrally. We cleanse it and make it consistent, and we return that back to you. You know, in a in a simple a consumable API. No, uh, no, you don't need to be. Pardon? Uh, our customers. I think so. The, the answer is our customers can call our API uh, because you know it's it's uh, we need we need to uh, we need to make a commercial return on this to pay for the uh, the investment and uh, the the AWS running costs. Thank you. Thank you.